Hey everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. And once again, I have the pleasure of having a success story here to share with you um, basically his journey with chronic pain and, and recovery. So this is Dennis from North Texas. Uh, welcome, Dennis. How are you doing today? Happy to be here, Dan. Pleasure to uh, hang out with you. Absolutely. I appreciate everything you do for everybody out there. You're a definite man that, that gives back in, a, in an awesome way, and I appreciate it. That's cool, man. Well, I appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do is just ask you to tell a little bit of your story as far as, you know, not I was born here and, you know, all this time, but kind of like your journey when it came to some chronic pain or other symptoms, um, what that journey looked like in the mainstream medical world, when you heard about this thing called TMS or mind-body syndrome, this guy, Dr. Sarno. Um, what I'm now calling perceived danger pain and uh, how long you were on that journey for before you kind of had the light bulb and things turned out the way they are now, which is you're doing great. So yeah, tell me the story, great. tell the, tell the viewers a story and bring us up so to date. I, so I, you know, I basically had a relatively you know, normal life and my first experience with any type of pain came in the mid 2000s so 2005 2006 area and um I was married at the time and just started getting pain in my leg and i'd never really had back problems you know i've rode, ridden motorcycles as a kid and, and crashed on motocross stuff and done a few stupid things every guy does but i never really hurt myself and i can remember when i first started getting pain down my leg, you know, sciatic pain. I didn't even know what it was. I thought I had a full hamstring. I mean, I didn't know what it was until finally somebody tells me, oh, that sounds like you have sciatica. So I, you know, go to a chiropractor, it takes a while. I don't have any pain. A couple months later, it comes flying right back again. And based on talking to chiropractors and people over the years, I just slowly bought into the idea that I just have a bad back. You know, we all looked at the x-rays and it's, oh, geez, look at this. And you've got a deteriorated this and a compressed that. And you've got some minor scoliosis and all this stuff. So I just thought there was something wrong with me. I think a lot of people with, with chronic pain think that. They think they've got some type of damage. And I, and I bought into it for forever. And we're talking, it just went on and on. And I would... I would have you know, days and weeks sometimes where it wasn't bugging me that much. And I would have those big, I think you call them episodes where pop, there it would go. And I'd be limping around, hard to get out of bed. You know, I'd be tilted over this side and that side, slowly work it out every single time. And I'd say for, from when it first started in the mid 2000s till just you know, a few months ago, I mean, I went to the chiropractor pretty much every week. Sometimes I might miss a week, but we're talking that entire time I went to a chiropractor. And in my mind, it was, well, if I wasn't doing that, I'd probably be so much worse. Um, and I never really did a lot of you know, Googling on the back because obviously that kind of just gets you even more souped up about it and upset, right? Oh, this could be bad. And, and I kind of had bought into this, Dan, that this is going to be my life and I'm probably just going to slowly deteriorate Till I get into my 60s and my 70s where I'm this hunched over person who's just got to sit on the couch, you know, watching whoever's hosting Jeopardy at that time or whatever. Right. And, and, and that was to me the way I, I, I kind of viewed it. And finally, something happened just pretty recently here. So again, to me, it was I had structural issues. Well, it was December 26th, just, you know, three months ago. And I went on a, a, a car trip, it took me about, you know, four or five hours round trip. And I, and I saw somebody that I had known from my past that so there was an emotional stuff around there. And I came back and, and I was feeling pretty good, right? I wasn't really having much pain or whatever. And I came back and the next day I woke up and just my hip and my back was hurting me. And I'm like, you know, what we do, car ride. It was a car ride, I was sitting in the car. So of course I make an appointment, I go to the chiropractor, they do their little stuff or whatever. I'm still a little sore. I come home. And for some reason on that day, Dan, I started thinking on the ride back. And I'm thinking to myself, this doesn't make sense. 
I had recently relocated from Colorado to Texas, and I took two 12, 13-hour trips, one in a U-Haul and one in my car, and I didn't have any back problems. Right. And now suddenly I do a five-hour car trip, and my back is bugging me. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? I, I, I don't know. What, there was no difference. It was the same car one time. So I got home, and of course, I get on Mr. Google. And this is where the interesting story happens. So I, I get on Google and I start looking about, you know, I, I, first I'm Googling bad back in car. And I go through and it's probably on the second page of Google and I see this little thing and it just says, John E. Sarno, feeling back pain. And I look at it and the name John Sarno, for some reason, I'd heard it before. Right. So I do a little research. I go on, you know, look at him on Wikipedia. And then, of course, tension myositis syndrome comes on there. And I read through this and I'm thinking, wait a second. I've never heard of this. I'm completely ignorant to TMS. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what's going on here. And one thing really caught me. At the very end of one of the Wikipedia thing, it said, a lot of modern medicine has discounted Dr. Sarno's theories. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want to make a political statement here, but my opinion is with all this COVID stuff, I think a lot of what the medical community has been shoveling us is garbage between masking and social. I, I, and when it said a lot of the medical community has discounted it, that actually just brought some credibility to me. Sure. So I instantly go to Amazon and I Google his book, Healing Back Pain, and the book comes up. And I look at it and I say, I've seen this book cover before. And right down there, believe it or not, Dad, it said, order this book again. And I'm like, what? <laughs> order this book again? So I look at it. Well, I'm a big avid reader, right? I read probably five, six, seven books a month. And whenever I see something on Amazon or it's recommended to me, I buy it and I put it in my big, I've probably got 30 books I've still got to read. Sure. And I go look in this pile. Sure enough, five months before I had ordered this book and it had been sitting there. <laughs> Love it. It is so I sit down again. This is the just one day after I'd made this car trip. I sat down in on my on my, uh, my couch and I read the entire book in like four or five hours. About two-thirds of the way through the book, I was like, This is me. This man is describing me. I feel like he's talking to me. I finished that book probably at seven o'clock that night, and that was exactly it. I knew 100% I had TMS and there was nothing wrong with me reading that book. Awesome. So that's when I kind of grasped the whole TMS thing. This is what it was. And there was, Dan, there was not, there was not a half a percent doubt. There was a half a percent doubt in my mind. That was it. I knew there was nothing because. I think a lot of people that have TMS, I mean, we know that some of them are perfectionists, so they're do-gooders, but they're, and I've seen them in your group and other groups, they're pretty darn smart people. Yes. They just kind of overanalyze a lot, but I think if, if they just look down and says, what doesn't, doesn't make sense. And when Sarno's saying in the book, he says, look, your body heals. It's not built to not heal. That resonated with me. I'm going like, why would my back be the only thing in my entire body that something just can't heal? That doesn't make any sense the way he puts it. And in your entire life too, because you've, yeah. you've crashed motocross bikes, you've, you know, you're a human being, you get injured. Yeah, you get injured, you get, you get sick, you recover from it, hopefully. And, you know, unless you have a really bad cancer, we generally always recover from stuff. Yes. So I was just convinced of it. So... I, I joined a couple of groups. I joined your program and I just started going through it. I think I went over through your whole program in a day. I started watching some of your videos online. I did some, and I did some stuff. I didn't do it exactly how everybody said it was to me. Um, instead of focusing on a thousand different things, I really kind of focused on kind of what Sarno said, stop the physical treatments, which I did immediately. I mean, I remember the next day I called and canceled my chiropractic appointment for the next month, week. Um, I started to do a couple other things. I remember I'm a very symbolic type of person. So I went and I got a piece of paper out and I wrote down every single diagnosis every doctor has told me about my back. I just wrote it on this piece of paper. Right. And I went out to my backyard. I cracked a beer. 
I fired up my fire pit and I burnt that son of a bitch up. <laughs> Symbolically, it. that was those diagnoses, me giving those di diagnoses the middle finger and saying, you don't exist anymore for me. Right. And um, I, I, I did that, Dan. I, you know, of course I did some meditation stuff, but it was more just sticking to it. And, and some of your stuff really resonated with me with the whole try to be indifferent to the symptoms. Don't let them control you. And I just said, I'm going to do everything I normally do. And I don't care if I get the biggest flare up on planet earth. I don't care. Right. It doesn't matter to me, but I would say within one week, 95% of any chronic pain was gone. I would say a week after that, all pain was gone. I didn't have anything. Does that mean that my subconscious didn't fight back a little bit? No, it, it, it rode its ugly head. You know, there's a few things that happen where it's like, okay, what's with this tight muscle and this spasm in my back, what's going on? But I just went with it. I think it was something you taught or probably it was just like, okay, what just happened that you stuffed down? And then it was generally, okay, a client just pissed me off and I didn't want to face it. I got a text from somebody I didn't want to deal with. And it got to the point where when these little things happen for probably another couple of weeks, they would go away within minutes because I would generally register on what it was. Um, I did uh, start seeing a therapist, uh, which I would recommend to people. I think everybody to a degree, you don't have to go out and get a big, in my opinion, a big psychotherapist unless you have a lot of trauma. I did do that and it wasn't done to unpack a whole bunch of horrible stuff. One of the things I found really valuable was there was a situation from my past, a relationship that my conscious mind was saying, well, you should have guilt about. But when we unpacked all that, I actually had a lot of resentment and anger. So essentially, I'm thinking I'm dealing with a guilt thing, but my subconscious is repressing a ton of anger. Well, once that got unpacked, that whole situation went away. Um, I did, I'm kind of a pretty high sprung guy. So I did work with another gal uh, about how to, how to really relax yourself pretty much through the entire day. And I think that's helped a lot on any fight or flight stuff. But I think the vast majority is just, just the brain. The, the last thing to go, and I know a lot of TMS would really deal with this. And even after my pain had stopped, um, one of the things that I think a lot of us do is that constant body, body monitoring where you're caught, you're, even though you don't, hey, you're kind of like, okay, when I stand up now, is this going to be the time it's going to hurt? Or is this going to happen? And that right. kind of, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Of course, monitoring, checking, yeah. looking for it. It's like, where is it? I got to find it. Yeah, and, it, it, and I'll tell you, that was really frustrating because you're going like, Dennis, you're not in any pain. Why are you thinking about it? It's because I trained my brain for over 15 years to do that. So it did take a while before, uh, you know, you just... It, that probably took a, probably about another month to six weeks. And then all of a sudden, just one day, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, I, you don't even think about it anymore. You don't bend over and think about it. You don't do this and think about it. You don't do anything. It's, it's just virtually completely gone. Right. And it, it's, uh, I know my journey was a lot quicker than a lot of other people's. I, I can tell you, Dan, and we can talk a little bit more about it. To me, the big difference happened when I closed that book. And I just said, this is me. This is what I have. I don't have a doubt. Right. Yeah, because that clarity, that certainty, a lot of people are not achieving that. They don't, they're still kind of thinking that the doubt and the questioning and the continued searching is helping them stay safer because they're saying, well, what if the doctor missed something? Maybe it's something else. Well, that fear and that doubt actually delays recovery and doesn't necessarily help them be safer because anytime the brain is uncertain, it's going to likely keep you safe by keeping the pain going to protect you from perceived dangers. So I have a question for you. Sure. You had said at one point uh, during this journey, you decided to do some therapy and focus on, you know, unpacking some things in your life. Where did that fall in line with your recovery? You said early on, Within a week, like 90, 95% was gone. Within a couple of weeks, all the pain symptoms were gone. And again, you said some hiccups and speed bumps along the way, 
um, as your subconscious was like, wait a minute, time out. What are you doing? Right. Yeah. But for the most part, you achieved pain free within a short window of time. Where did the therapy fall in line? Because I'm sure a number of people are going to be wondering, well, how much of it was the therapy and the things that you unpacked versus, in my opinion, I believe it's the clarity. And you know what else the clarity does for you? What is it? What happened to your fear levels about your back? Went from way up here to way down here. Yeah. Certainty, clarity. I do say, I'm not afraid of this anymore. And without the attention, without the fear, you got better very quickly. And that's what I really want to emphasize for anybody watching this is the sooner you can get to that point of decision, the faster you're going to recover. And every time you waver and stay on the fence, that will delay things for you. So right. where was the therapy in that picture as far as um, timing? All of the pain was gone before I started with the therapist. Good um, to know. <laughs> yeah. I, part of it, Dan, was I told you the, the person that I had uh, met kind of had triggered that thing in my hip. The reason I, went, I, I started seeing the therapist was because that person texted me. And it was insane because that person texted me out, out of the blue and I immediately got like a spasm in that same area. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is something else. You think you've gotten past all this, but it's not that. So that's why I really kind of started meeting with, with the therapist to get past that type of stuff. And it wasn't really, I didn't really start seeing the therapist per se for TMS. Um, but I did learn a lot about myself doing that and a lot about emotions because a lot of these repressed emotions, we don't even know we have them. And right. I did learn a lot about that. And it has helped. Where, it, where it's helped a lot, Dan, is just because our brain has been taught to do stuff for a long time. And that's repressed. And that's just our default system. And I'm trying to get to the, that point where I really recognize this stuff before it could ever happen. And I think I'm 100% there. I, I mean, I know I'm past this. It doesn't bother me. It, I don't care. But I've learned a lot about myself going through that process and, and doing that. And the gal that helps me with the, with the breathing stuff and the just calming down, uh, I think that's been definitely beneficial too. But again, that happened uh, after the pain had stopped too. It was the, the elimination of any of the chronic pain was the clarity. It was the, I don't fear it anymore. It doesn't matter to me. It was the whole, there's nothing wrong with me. Right. And I think that's what a lot of people really need to kind of grasp on is that whole, there is nothing wrong with you. Cause it's, and it's funny when you, it's not funny, but it's, you look at these, some of these TMS groups and I will tell you my brain, the way it works is this. I don't see how you could be 95% sure you have TMS. You're either hundred percent or you're zero percent. I don't really see anything along the lines there. If I'm still 5% clinging to something, then that's what it is. And I see, a lot of people in TMS, they almost like their identity is their diagnosis. That's almost the first thing they lay out there. I have this, I have this, and they're constantly referring back to it. That's why I did that symbolic thing of burning that piece of paper because I'm like, this, this is not me anymore. I do not have any of this yeah. stuff. I probably never did, or I've got it. And it just does like Sarno says in the book, everyone's got, got deteriorated. You have a deteriorated disc by the time you're 20. Yeah. You have all this stuff. It just shouldn't be causing you pain. So stop it. I think a lot of people own those diagnoses of themselves. They are that thing and they carry that around with them. Um, I know people I just might think about it in my past that you start talking to people, just strangers out there. And it seems like within 15 minutes, they start bringing up their ailments. Yep. I've had this or I've had that. I'm going like, well, that's who you are. Then you, you can't be that person. You have to be Dan, the healthy guy, Dennis, the healthy guy. You can't be Dan, the great guy who's got this and this. That to me is always going to yeah. make your subconscious default to, okay, well, let's go ahead and give it a little pain and, and on that. Yeah. I was definitely the guy with the back pain. I remember hanging out at like a neighborhood, you know, picnic block party type of thing. And I was the guy with the back pain. I was out weed whacking once and my neighbor from across the street came charging across the street. Dan, are you crazy? You're going to end up like my husband getting back surgery. Put that weed whacker down. You shouldn't be doing that. I was the guy with back pain and it became kind of who I was. 
And if I'd go over to a family's house, I was the one who'd probably find myself laying on the couch, you know? So yeah, you're right. The identity is who I became and it's very common, uh, which is also why I've done several videos about lose the medical labels. If somebody tells you, you've got fibromyalgia, that shouldn't be the fourth word out of your mouth when you meet somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? We have to stop identifying with those medical labels because in many cases, the medical labels are incorrect or they're inconsequential. Yeah. It's, when, I, when I figured out the TMS thing and I, um, I called my girlfriend that night and I said, this is what I have. And I explained it to her and it made total sense to her because I was that guy who took pride in never getting mad never getting sad, never getting overly happy. I was just Mr. Even Keel. I suppressed everything. Mm -hmm. And I told her that night, I said, don't ever ask me again how my back is, ever. If you want to ask me and say, how are your TMS symptoms? I'm okay with that first period. I said, but don't ask me how my back is ever again. My back is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So I don't even want to be asked. And I also count uh, counsel my coaching clients, the group coaching clients, and even in the videos to stop talking about your pain and your back and your body and your fibro and your neuropathy. And because the more you're talking about it, the more you're just keeping it going, right? This exactly. is a neuroplastic process where there are neural pathways that keep it going. And I always say the best way to talk about your pain is as little as possible, zero. And I did the same exact thing you did late in my journey. I, sh I should have done it earlier, which was coaching the people around me. Hey, stop asking me. And I tell people I, I coach, I say, you need to advise your family, even your spouse, to not ask you 85 times a day how you're doing. Because all they're doing is bringing you back to the pain. And so just tell them, I know you love me. You're asking because you care for me. I care for you too but that isn't going to help me move forward. So assume I'm fine. If I need help, I will let you know. And that's important. And, and intuitively you did that for yourself very quickly. So awesome. You know, an, another thing I think like a little, cause I think a lot of TMS folks are sort of looking for strategies or things to do. Um, I felt this was really helpful when I did it. And again, this could have been something you taught that I read. I, don't, I can't remember where I heard it or somebody else, but I think a lot of TMSers look for re people that are struggling with their recovery. They're looking for reasons to make it structural. Okay, here's proof it is something wrong with me. What I did is I consciously every day, I would write down three or five things in my journal at the end of the day proving it was TMS. Evidence. Or, yeah, evidence that, not that evidence that it's something structurally wrong, proof that it was TMS. For instance, you wake up, you know, the first or second day I started, I wake up and I have a little bit of a, kind of a little twinge in my back, and an hour later it's gone. To me, that's proof it's TMS, because if I had a structural problem, why would it stop hurting? It'd be there constantly. If yeah, I had a little bit of a tight, yeah, or it would hurt more because now you're up and moving. Right. So the fact that it went away, to me, was nothing. The fact that, you know, I, I look down and I say, great, I'm going to do some bench pressing today. I'm going to pick up two 65-pound dumbbells, pick them up both off the ground at one time and do this stuff without having the slightest bit of problem. That proves it's TMS because right. if, if, if I'm going to get, if my back's going to get her bending over to pick up a trash can or something, or a little waste basket, why would that, that makes no sense when I'm lifting up these heavy weights. So I would constantly do that. And, and I think, and that, and I think what that did over the first few weeks or something is that just, I'm constantly inundating myself. Yep. This proves it. This proves it. This proves it. I would take note. I wouldn't per se dwell on any pain or something, but if I had a little bit of a creak somewhere and then you know, later on in the day, it was completely vanished. That proves it's TMS. Right. Yeah. So I, I often talk about the power of a decision and how decision precedes a belief. Because if you decide 
this TMS mind-body stuff is what's going on, you'll soon find evidence to support that decision. And when you find the evidence, your belief starts to grow. And the more you stick with that decision and stick with that belief, the more evidence you find. And you did that intuitively. You know, in other circles, that's called a cognitive bias. You have a view and then you just seek to always find evidence that confirms your view to be correct. We're not going political, but that's exactly how belief works. If we believe in something, we're going to look for evidence that supports that belief. So why not make a decision which precedes belief that this is what's going on with me? so that you can start to believe that, and then your brain will automatically, using this thing called the reticular activating system, start looking for that evidence that supports your belief, and it becomes kind of a nice um, loop. Instead of a fear loop, it's actually a belief loop, that the more you believe, the more evidence you're gonna find, and therefore the more you believe, and before you know it, it's like you're rock solid. So. Well said. Yeah. So. You know, intuitively, you came across some of this stuff. You made a decision after you closed that book. And then from there, you look for evidence. You completely, what do they say, burn the boats, right? You burned the boats. You burned the papers that says, here's all my medical diagnoses and test results. And you burned the boats, right? And that's that old wartime thing where, you know, they land on foreign shores they burn the boats so that the only way they can escape is through victory, right? And so burning that paper was, like you said, it was, uh, it was symbolic just, to me. Symbolic, yeah. 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 That was the word I was looking for, but just wasn't there. Um, yeah. So you did a lot of right things. And why I keep on sharing these things with people on these videos is because when you know what's going on and you make a decision, start to believe it, and you do the right things, which is consistent messaging to yourself that I'm okay, you can get better fast. And, you know, people will be like, oh, but I've had pain a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so did you. I mean, you had pain for what, 17 years? Yep. Yep. Thereabouts? Long and time. so the length of time we have symptoms does not determine the length of recovery. And a lot of people think, well, I've got all these well-worn neural pathways and it's going to take me a long time because it took me a long time to get here. Nope, not true. Not true at all. And you're evidence of that. Me too. I made all the mistakes in the world for 13 years, even though I knew about Sarno for 12 of them. But I identified with the symptoms. I was the bad back guy. And so I never really got out of my head and into living. So... Yeah. I'm proud of you, man. You did exactly the right stuff. Um, I appreciate that. It, you know, there's a, for, for the people out there that are on their recovery journey, and I know that, I know they want to be pain-free, and we mm -hmm. all do. I would encourage them, there's a book out there, it's uh, written by Dan Sullivan, it's called uh, The Gap in the Game. And it's a really good book. He, he ties it a little bit more towards goals, but with TMS, it's the same thing. So. We set a goal. We're here. We have a lot of chronic pain. And our goal is to be completely pain free. Mm -hmm. And when we don't get that completely pain free by a certain amount of time that we want it to happen, we get mad, we get upset, this isn't working, blah, blah, blah. And what Dan explains in the book is he said, look, you can't focus on the end goal. You have to focus on the gains you've made. So if, if you're looking at, say you say, I want to be, say someone's got, just discovers that they're on their TMS journey and they say, I want to be pain-free by the end of June. And a month from now, they're not pain-free. They're going to, of course, get frustrated. But if, but if you listen down, you go, okay, have you had some good days? Yeah. I've seen the people in your group post, some of the people that are real struggling say, I went out and did this and I didn't have pain and I did this. To me, you have to look at what have you gained? You gain it. You're even if you're just ten percent better. That's ten percent better. Yeah, which is exactly yeah, which is exactly why I begin these group weekly sessions with success stories. Yes. So not only the people listening can hear it, but the people themselves can go, 
oh, I did have a couple of victories this week. Yeah. Right? And I always say, throw away your calendar. Don't set a deadline for pain recovery because what happens, like you said, is, all right, let's say you want to be done by June 1st. Well, by May 1st, you're going to be like, holy crap, I'm not better yet. Pressure, 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 fear, fear, fear. And all of a sudden, you're pushing it farther away. You'll delay recovery by wanting it done by a certain point. And I often say that, you know, when do you get pain free? When you no longer care when it happens. You focus on the core message, which is, I'm not broken. There's nothing wrong with me. When your brain gets that memo, things happen. And they can happen very quickly. I don't know if you experienced this when you were recovering, but it was funny. I was telling you that you know my subconscious was sort of fighting back a little. It's last, I, I, I kind of viewed it as its last few sputters. But it was interesting. I, I, I know Sarno and a couple other people have said that they talk really aggressively to their subconscious. And they say, you stop it. I'm not taking that plane, blah, blah, blah. I didn't really do that because to me, that part of my brain was doing what it thought it was supposed to be doing, protecting me. So... I tried this method because I saw everybody doing that stuff. I'm like, I don't want to be yelling at myself. So the method I kind of took, Dan, is when that happened, I pictured like my twin. And this twin's job was kind of like to protect me. And every time I'd get this little twinge or something, I'd kind of just go like, dude, don't need it. You can let it through. You realize once you stop doing this, our life is going to be unbelievably good. The quicker you stop it, the quicker we're going to have a great life yeah. is how I talk to my, my little brother, my little subconscious. And you're I think negotiating. you're negotiating with compassion, with understanding. I know you're just trying to keep me safe, but I'm not concerned. So you don't need to be either. Yep. Right. And I think for me, that worked way better than yelling and screaming at it to me. I was just like, man, I'm just going to talk to it and just do that. And it was funny. It, it was probably, you know, that month long line when everything went away where, I don't know, one day I just woke up and I was just walking around and I just had this feeling that like my subconscious had just said, all right, jigs up. Yeah. He knows everything I'm trying. It doesn't work anymore. I quit. Yeah. Subconscious said, all right, dude, I'm on board. Yeah. I'll just hang down here and I'll just, I'll just run all these other internal organs and stuff like that and maybe do my little organizing, but I don't need to cover for you on that anymore. Yeah. And that all just comes right back to, you said, trying to protect you. It all comes back to the brain's perception of danger. Yeah. And that is what turns on and keeps pain persistent. So it's our job to get clear, accurate information, make a decision so that it becomes easier, not easy, but easier to convince our own selves and our own brains that there's nothing dangerous happening. And once we do, once the brain buys that and understands that there's nothing wrong with me, the whole thing can fizzle out. Yep. So it's, it's purely perceived danger is what's driving this. And you had 17 years of perceived danger. And I had 13 and people have decades worth. Um, so safety is always the solution. Well, the way you got safety was information accurate information decision clarity belief and then consistency because had you gone two weeks and gotten like most of the way out but then you know a little flare up had you freaked out we wouldn't be on this call right now because freaking out screams at the brain holy shit, we are in trouble mm -hmm. right so you set you right back to square one when you, when you do that stuff maybe not all the way back but it's certainly going to delay things you know, so brilliant stuff, man. Anything else you feel compelled to share? No, Dan, you know, it, it, for people watching this that haven't been through Dan's program or don't follow him a lot, I would encourage you to do that. I learned a lot from him. Your consistency with your daily videos is so admirable. Most people throw a video out every once or two of the month. You're there every single day getting the people. Uh, I would just say, listen, listen a day and keep listening to them. If you haven't joined his group, join this group, do it. It's a great support group, great folks in there. They're in the same journey, different levels than you are. So yeah, I, I just recommend you big time, Dan. I appreciate everything you did for me. No, I appreciate it. And consistency matters. I say that all the time with the messages to ourself about the clarity that we're not broken. Um, 
And I always say consistent messages of safety. Well, that's what my daily videos are. I got people around the globe messaging me through YouTube and Facebook saying, I'm better thanks to your stuff. Or, you know, and, and these are people who are not even clients of mine. They've just been watching my YouTube and getting better. And it's nothing could be more rewarding for me than to actually get that type of feedback on a, virtually a daily basis. So it's awesome. For it, man. So thank you very much. Probably take a few business days for us to post this. Keep an eye on the Facebook group and the YouTube group. Um, and I really appreciate it, man. You're an inspiration. Uh, and in my mind, you are evidence of clarity leading to fast recovery. The people who are always questioning and staying in fear because what if something else is really going on, those people end up taking a lot longer to recover. And you also got to a point, maybe because you've had some real accidents, riding dirt bikes or whatever, where you've experienced real injuries and you were able to see that your body heals. I actually have a buddy of mine who's 50 years old. He's been racing motocross since he was three years old. And he's broken more bones than I think we have in our body. You know, he's had hundreds of broken bones, dozens and dozens of surgeries, including his neck. And this guy, 50 years old, he's still jumping on his dirt bike and flying 50 feet, you know, over these huge doubles and triples. So he's proven, though, that when you get hurt, injured, it hurts a lot. But his body heals every single time. He has no chronic pain, which is wild for a guy who's busted himself up so many times. So the body heals. This TMS, this mind-body stuff, perceived danger pain is something completely different. And when you get your mind straight, it can go away and go away quickly. Dennis, you are proof of that. So I'm thrilled that you're willing to share your story. Unless you've got anything else, man. I will wrap this up with you and thank you. And uh, for anybody watching, this is what's possible for everybody. But take a lesson from Dennis in his decision, clarity, and consistency in making sure his brain understood that this and this alone was the only thing going on. You keep vacillating back and forth, you're not doing yourself any favors. So, Dennis, brother, I appreciate you. Appreciate you, Dan. Thanks for everything, buddy. You're a rock star, man. Thank you. I know. Okay.